Yesterday, I was struck by the similarities between Pam's description of the impact that you had on her life and my own description. The truth is, like Pam, I was incredibly blessed by you when I was a student in the program, and I too can say that you changed my life. I had a lot of ambivalence about coming to Fuller and pursuing the MFT profession. In fact, uh, the first time I had even heard of a marriage and family therapist was just two months before I applied <laughs> for the program. So I had a lot of ambivalence and uncertainty, and I didn't know what to expect. So I decided I would come, give it one quarter, and see if it fit. And if it did, I would stay. We know how the story ends. But what happened was, in that first quarter, I took your Intro to Family Systems class. And I started to soak in every lecture that you gave. For the first time, I began to better understand myself and to develop a language for the relational dynamics in my family and the Korean American community in which I grew up. Mind you, it was mostly pathologizing language because of the Western perspective of individuality, boundaries, and relational health vis-a-vis -vis a Korean American immigrant family. But it was language and it was a starting point for me to start thinking about my, the sense of my experience as a second generation Korean American growing up with a bicultural identity. And it wasn't lost on me that as an Asian American professor, you were expanding my imagination about what was possible for me and what I could do because you were doing it. So thank you, Cameron for inviting me to respond to your presentation today. It really is quite amazing to consider that 22 years ago, maybe almost to the day, I was sitting in your class as a student. And today, I'm responding to your talk on compassion and Sabbath rest as a colleague. I'm humbled by your confidence in me, and I'm grateful for your desire to know how I'm thinking about such matters. Being colleagues in the marriage and family department, we have ample opportunities to think about and talk through these clinical virtues of humility, hope, compassion, and Sabbath rest, and the vocation of peacemaking, particularly as it is in the heart of our integration curriculum. So it isn't surprising that what you have shared these past few days have a lot of resonance for me. So what I'll do today is simply add my own texture and nuance to your thoughts on compassion, hospitality, and Sabbath rest as virtues and traditions that restore communion among ourselves and our communion with God. When talking about compassion, you describe the poor in spirit as our clients who may be in emotional distress, but also might experience rejection, shame, and isolation due to the stigma of therapy and what others think it says about them that they need this form of help. More broadly and beyond the therapy room, the poor in spirit are those in our society who are marginalized as a result of the misperceptions and assumptions people make about the worth and value of their life based on their level of education, the color of their skin, their sexual identity, their socioeconomic status, their political or religious affiliations, and the list goes on. Cameron, you urge us to have compassion upon the poor in spirit just as Jesus did throughout his ministry of teaching and healing. And you provided stories of Jesus' healing without the requirement of a request or an expectation of a thanks. That in these instances, the restoration of sight or the ability to walk came unexpectedly to those who were healed and came out of Christ's compassion. But there are also those stories, and you did talk about some of these. These stories of Jesus being pursued for his healing powers by individuals who humbly and desperately pleaded for healing. In fact, in some of the stories, it seems that Jesus is the one who was surprised. For example, the woman who bled for 12 years and pleaded in desperation by touching the edge of his garment. The story of Jairus who pleaded with Jesus to heal his dying daughter. Mary and Martha, who begged that he would heal their brother Lazarus, or the centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant. Oftentimes, the people seeking healing were unlikely suspects, but in asking, in spite of the odds, their faith was being revealed. 
either out of sheer desperation or irrational conviction, they believed that Jesus could heal and they were willing to do whatever it took <clears throat> to ask. Whenever I hear these stories of healing, I always construct a scene in my mind where the person approaches Jesus and immediately the, the crowd comes to a hushed silence. At best, this is awkward. At worst, perhaps this is offensive. I'm always struck by these moments, but then I think about what must be going on in the heart of the person who is petitioning Jesus' help. When you love someone so much, or you're fighting for life yourself, you're willing to do whatever it takes to, to ask, whatever it takes to help bring restoration and healing. You gather all your courage, you find your voice, and you ask. You ask, like Esther risking her life for her people and approaches the king without an invitation to ask for a meeting. In spite of that, you ask. So alongside the compassion we must have for those who are marginalized and alongside the efforts we make to narrow the gap that is created between them and life, having compassion also means that we see them as God sees them, as his creation intended to live in the freedom of his righteousness and for the fulfillment of his glory. Having compassion means we help them ask by using our God-given gifts to be agents of reconciliation and of healing. We recognize that they are deserving of our compassion and Christ's compassion, but we also see that they have a voice to offer and we don't rob them of their own voices so that they might ask. We might help them learn for the first time or relearn again their ability to ask. Our desire is that, like the bleeding women, they will find their voices to ask for healing, even if others around them might not agree that they are deserving of Jesus' compassion. Now, this isn't a pull themselves up with their bootstraps kind of a notion. Not everyone has boots, and for some, their boots are so worn that their straps are about to fall off. But perhaps having compassion means that we, especially those of us who have privilege because we belong to the majority group or have power based on our social position or our social position as therapists, we use our privilege to help the marginalized, the poor in spirit, to put on their boots or to fasten their straps. And perhaps the greatest privilege that we as Christians have is that we, po we possess the knowledge of the gospel and the conviction of our faith, and that from this particular position of privilege, we are compelled to have compassion for the poor in spirit and to share with them the freedom and the courage to ask. Most of us got into this profession because we realized our ability to have extraordinary compassion and empathy for others. Oftentimes, I hear from students as they enter our program that they consistently received feedback from others about what good listeners they were and how empathic and compassionate others described them to be, almost like it was a prerequisite for becoming an MFT. But I would suggest that if we limit our understanding of compassion to being having the ability to have empathy for our clients and to hold them in their suffering, then we will run high the risk of compassion fatigue and burnout. Don't get me wrong. This aspect of compassion is essential to being a good therapist, but our compassion should never end there. Our compassion must compel us to see our clients and the gifts that they possess, to see them beyond the diagnosis and their dysfunction. We must continue to see them and help them find their voices so that they will be empowered to ask. Another theme that really emerged and resonated for me was that of hospitality. This concept of therapy as an act of hospitality really resonates with me in particular. The way you describe, quote, hospitality as an expression of compassion and how as therapists, we have the opportunity to show our clients this hospitality by providing safe, welcoming spaces makes good sense to me. You go on to talk about biblical references to hospitality, particularly when Abraham offered hospitality to the visiting strangers. And to, re to refer to the visitor as a stranger, I'm reminded of a conversation that I had with Christine Pohl about hospitality, and this is what she said, quote, perhaps we could say that hospitality's origin is in human vulnerability, sociality, and longings for community. As a stranger, a person is often vulnerable 
And when they're traveling, they're very dependent on the kindness of other strangers, other people whose community they're trying to enter. So I suspect that hospitality began as a form of mutual aid and that everybody was, in a sense, vulnerable." End quote. It's obvious to consider the visitor as a stranger, but unexpected to refer to the host as a stranger. And yet, in the context of that relationship, they, in fact, are strangers to one another. Typically, when we think about the visitor-host dynamic, we are aware of the imbalance of resources placing the host in a position of advantage as she or he possesses a physical and social advantage over the visitor. But in this conceptualization of hospitality, both the visitor and the host have mutual opportunity to be a blessing to the other. What is recaptured or restored is the dignity and worth of the visitor who has something to offer. When we recognize this truth, we are more likely to cultivate an authentic compassion for the poor in spirit the perpetual foreigner, the stranger, the other, the visitor, because they are blessed by us, but are also a blessing to us. In a therapeutic relationship, there necessarily isn't the mutuality and reciprocity of vulnerability that is expected in a non-therapeutic relationship. But I do think that what we're talking about here is applicable for therapists. Because although our clients, the visitors, come to us, the hosts, for help, to, in essence, receive a blessing, we too can be blessed by them. And although we don't share the same degree of vulnerability with our clients that they share with us, the therapeutic use of self and compassion that moves us to self-disclosure and an exposure of our own humanity in an appropriate way, of course, can enrich the blessing that goes both ways. Rachel Naomi Remen, a physician committed to restoring the humanity in practice of medicine, um, stated it beautifully when she described the practitioner-patient encounter as follows, quote, we serve life not because we see it as broken, but because we see it as holy. Of course, service itself is not a technique. It is a relationship, not a relationship between an expert and a problem, but between two whole human beings who bring the full power of their combined humanity to a situation. End quote. Therapeutic hospitality means we create a safe and welcoming space for our clients so that they might be blessed while also remaining open and receptive to the ways that they will bless us. Another way in which the theme of hospitality certainly had resonance for me is my experience growing up in an immigrant family, being strangers in this land. Although I was born in Canada, and grew up in the US, and my parents have now lived in North America for twice the number of years that they lived in their homeland of Korea, we were perceived and treated as perpetual foreigners. In so many ways, the experience of hospitality was elusive. But perhaps where there was a great exception was the Korean immigrant church in which I grew up. This was a place of hospitality a gathering of visitors, strangers, who became hosts to their own visitors, to their fellow visitors. This is where my parents felt known and free in their own language, in their own cultural practices, and this is where my family flourished. By no means was it perfect. It had its woes and challenges like any other immigrant church that eventually became a multi-generational church, but it was a safe, welcoming place for my family and for me. This, I believe, is what the church is supposed to be for anyone, host or visitor. It is meant to be a place of safety and welcoming so that its congregants can be known and can flourish. And finally, and really what I think is probably the reason why you asked me to be a respondent, is Sabbath rests. Um, this last theme that I would like to discuss is that of Sabbath rest as a virtue and a tradition that helps restore communion with God and communion among us. In the beginning of your talk, you made this distinction of humility, hope, and compassion as virtues, and Sabbath rest as more of a spiritual practice that supports those virtues. While I would agree that among the four, Sabbath rest has the most obvious practical element, I would say that Sabbath rest is about presence as much as it is about practice, and that the interplay between presence and practice becomes important. 
In his book, The Rest of God, Restoring Your Soul by Restoring Sabbath, Mark Buchanan writes, quote, Sabbath is both time on a calendar and a disposition of the heart, end quote. It is both about outward living as well as it is about inward orientation. But Sabbath void, Sabbath practice that is void of Sabbath presence results in hollow, meaningless actions and activities that are driven by mere habit or legalism, being everything short of a blessing to the Sabbath observer. And yet Sabbath presence that isn't anchored in an embodied practice can result in fleeting ideas that are challenged to take hold and bring about meaningful change in our minds and our hearts. Sabbath keeping is a communal practice and like any other practice, gets more deeply embedded, embedded into the individual when it is observed, valued, and reinforced communally. I thought, what would it be like if Fuller took a 24-hour Sabbath? It won't happen, I'm sure, but I'm just saying, <laughs> wouldn't that be amazing? No emails for 24 hours. Growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, which from now on I will refer to as SDA, and living in an SDA community, I was taught the importance of both Sabbath practice as well as Sabbath presence. In fact, in my own narrative, I would go as far as to say that um, Sabbath rest is probably one of the most informative uh, practices in my Christian faith. That, and this particularly became true when I, as an adult, came to really appreciate the beauty and the richness of Sabbath rest and observance, and began to really understand it to be both a, a commandment and a gift for both practice and for presence. I was taught at home and in school that Sabbath rest helps us remember that we are created beings meant for rest, and that Sabbath was tied to the gratitude for work as well as compassion for those who cannot rest or who cannot work. And that Sabbath was tied to the gratitude for work as well as, as, as a practice, the rhythm of family and community life was organized around the Sabbath. For example, on Fridays, school got out at noon so that we could all go home and start preparing for the Sabbath. Stores closed an hour before sundown, and as the dusk hours rolled in every Friday, it was as if, as if the world started to quiet down, and the frenetic energy that so often filled our homes and the community during the week began to dissipate. The practice and presence of Sabbath runs deep. Down to the marrow of my bones, I still feel the rhythm of Sabbath, so that even though I no longer worship in the SDA church or live in an SDA community, my husband and I choose to continue Sabbath observance in our family, and I still feel the shift on Friday afternoons during those dusk hours. There's a release and a welcoming that settles in, both in body and in spirit, in a way that doesn't happen at any other day of the week. And so, although I agree that Sabbath is not simply an opportunity to get away from work, but rather to cultivate a right relationship to our work, I will admit that I'm profoundly appreciative of the opportunity to step away from the demands and the pressures of work for just one day. And for those for whom work is less about job satisfaction or vocational fulfillment and more about mere survival, for those who work in conditions that challenge the assumptions of justice and dignity that we take for granted, if those folks, if they are given the opportunity to have Sabbath rest, I agree that the rest ought to pose an opportunity for them to be restored in their relationship with God and to have a, relate, and to have a right relationship with their work. But I, I wonder what a right relationship with one's work is supposed to look like when the work in the workplace is oppressive. As Christians who believe that the Sabbath was created for us by a God who desires to restore us, how do we help the poor in spirit know the gift of the Sabbath and Sabbath rest? How intentional are we in making sure that the lifestyles we live don't require perpetuation of the kind of work that is oppressive for others? Sabbath rest brings us back to God, but is also a means to bring us back to our awareness of one another. You stated that Sabbath rest is an opportunity to remember who we are, the beloved children of a God who blesses the poor in spirit, 
who feeds those wandering in the desert. I agree that Sabbath rest, both as a practice and a presence, has the potential to restore our identity. Like the Jewish people for whom the Sabbath commandment was given to them as a gift to help restore them back to a right relationship with God after being in exile for so many generations, Sabbath rest helps us know ourselves rightly as people wholly dependent upon a God who continuously brings us back to Him. As Christian therapists, we hold this truth as the wind that powers our work with clients. Some of us work in contexts that may not allow us to explicitly speak the, these words, but we believe that our clients are God's creation, wholly in need of the invitation to rest in His redemption. And so we embody this first by practicing rest as we know ourselves rightly in the limitations of our own humanity. And we help our clients understand the limitations of their humanity, not as failures or as shortcomings, but rather as the normal condition of being human from the macro level of society to the cellular molecular level of our physical being, rest is necessary for our health and for our relationships. I'm grateful to have been part of this conversation. And my hope is that the fruit that is born of these conversations these last three days is that we will have compassion for ourselves and those who are meek, that we would be hospitable to the strangers in our midst, believing they will be a blessing to us as we are to them, and that we will rest in God, and in so doing, the restoration of our relationship with Him and with one another will be known. Thank you.